When I was watching the dancers, all of that expression, the range of emotions from sensuality and passion to strength, to vulnerability, to love, each of the dances had its own personality. And as a human or a woman, there were so many facets of myself that I hadn't yet explored. There's just something so on a human level, soul to soul that happens when you're moving together. And for me to do these dances in these places, I got to feel what the culture was. I got to really feel it in my body. Dear Family is a podcast hosted by Rachel Steinman, a writer, an educator, and a mental health advocate. And Rachel gets us up close and personal, so we feel a strong connection, familiarity, and comfort with her guests. So settle in and join us as we search for true healing and journey with Rachel and her most interesting guests. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Dear Family, the podcast. Now that I'm publishing every other week, I hope you've had a chance to catch up on some of the episodes you may have missed. I also want to thank you so much for subscribing. So those episodes are waiting for you. I also am hoping that you are starting to get some spring fever and maybe even seeing some signs of spring and rebirth and some blue skies and flowers and just enjoying the moment and being present. Thank you so much for following me on this journey. I cannot tell you how much it means to me. If you're not already following me on all the social media platforms, please check them out at Right Now Rachel. That's right with a W. I'm so excited to bring you JC. She's not just an incredible guest. She also happens to be my beautiful sister-in-law. Enjoy, take care of yourself, and remember your mental health is just as important as your physical health. JC Gossett is a dancer, a model, an actor, a teacher, a podcaster, and a wanderluster. And she believes the limitations we experience, whether they're physical, emotional, or spiritual, are tied together. A true mind-body connection. JC shines a light on how movement connects us and brings us so much joy while bringing her years of competitive Latin ballroom dancing into schools, to wedding couples, and into her wildly popular exercise classes. JC has worked in front of and behind the camera. She produced and starred in a show for the Travel Channel called Dance the World, highlighting how people move their bodies in different ways all over the globe. After growing up around many brothers and their friends, she shares why women need other women, and her unforgettable goddess retreats that celebrate divine femininity that are held in Costa Rica and Brazil, they were named one of the best retreats by Well and Good. She She's a founding teacher and the VP of training at The Class, a cathartic workout for the body and mind that was started by Taryn Toomey, Jennifer Aniston, Christy Turlington, and Giselle, among many others, say it is their favorite workout because it not only is great exercise, it is a spiritual release through music, movement, and breath work where you're pushed to get uncomfortable in order to change. JC continues that conversation in her new podcast, The Class, where she creates a mental and emotional toolbox using the same three pillars discussed in the class, curiosity, which is a desire to learn, vulnerability, which is a state of openness, and authenticity, which is showing up in a genuine way. Before marrying my awesome brother, Adam Callen, whose Dear Family podcast episode number one, she dated Val Kilmer for three years, and she credits him for her introduction into spirituality and a love for nature. She's a true wanderluster, and she shares how her first year of marriage went during a pandemic in a Brooklyn apartment that she shares as a newlywed with a cute but rambunctious puppy. And JC opens up about her infertility journey and the challenges that she's been through. She rids the shame and stigma around a topic many of us are often too fearful to bring up. But in the end, she is helping so many others to see that they are not alone. JC is a dreamer who inspires others to dream and find the power within themselves. She encourages us to overcome limitations through movement and guided self-exploration. Welcome, JC. I'm so happy to have you on Dear Family. We're sisters-in-law because you married my awesome brother, Adam, and 
for the listeners that have not had a chance to check out episode one, he was my first guest and I am so grateful that he believed in me from day one. (laughs) And I know that you continue to make Adam so happy and you're both so in love and it's so beautiful to watch, but you also need to know that you made my mom so happy because we, Lori, (laughs) oh, mom, mom was also episode 50. Lori or mom or whatever we want to call her, wasn't sure if Adam would ever get married. And so (laughs) you truly just made her thrilled and so excited. So thank you for that. Of course. And which one day I want to know why, why she thought that he would never get married. (laughs) I don't know. He always was a ladies man. I mean, the phone was always ringing through high school. Oh, and he Uh, knows it. And he knows it. well aware of that. That that, that man does not meet a mirror. He doesn't like, but (laughs) I will say we really helped each other and have such a deep friendship and learn so much from each other. I learned so much from him. He, I hope learns from me. And I'm sure there are many days, especially in this past pandemic where I'm not making him the happiest man, you know, we're working on it. Well, from the outside looking in, he is just so enamored by you Aww. and always has been in love with you. It's the cutest thing to see. I have to say from a, as a sister who just also adores my brother. So Thank you for being here and thank you for making Adam so happy and my mom. All right. Now, because this is a podcast called Dear Family, I'd like to begin by asking you to tell us a little bit about your family. Originally, I grew up in a very small town in New Jersey. It's called Roseland, New Jersey. It's in Essex County. When I was growing up, the population was probably close to 5,000 people, small town. And My parents moved there probably in the early 70s. My mom had four boys and me, but she also raised my cousin, her nephew. So there was five boys in the house and me. My oldest brother is 10 years above me. And then my youngest brother, like you and Adam, is a year and a half after me. So there was me and my younger brother, and then this big gap between the older brothers. But that's a lot of boys in the house. A lot of boys. And my mom is and was a very generous woman. She opened up our house to friends in need, children of her own friends that needed a place to go, animals. We had lots of different people living with us at different times at one point. Six cats, a dog, a ferret, a snake. There was a lot of activity. (laughs) Wow. How old were you when your parents got divorced? When I was about 16, my parents separated. And then when the divorce finalized, at that point, I'm about 18. Most of your formative years, you had both parents married. Got it. Now, you are a dancer. You carry yourself like a dancer. And whether you're dancing at your wedding or at my daughter's bat mitzvah, (laughs) when you get on the dance floor, people step back and watch you. You just have this way about you. Tell us how dancing came into your life and about competitive ballroom dancing. What's funny is growing up and still, I'm really a shy person. If you really know me. I, I just am shy on the inside, even though I have a job that is very expressive and I work on camera and television and the class that I teach is on digital. And I'm very much a performer. There is still that part of me on the inside. That's always just like, Oh, wants to contract and retract a little bit. When my mom finally had me, she was very excited about having a girl. She had all these boys in the house. It was a chance for her to introduced me to all the things that she either wanted to do, didn't get to do, or loved to do. There was a lot of things on that list, but dance was the thing that I resonated the most with as a small kid teetering around. Being in dance class was the highlight of my week. I couldn't wait to go to dance. I felt so much more like myself when I was dancing. It helped me come out of my shell, especially in those teenage years where you're feeling so uncomfortable in your body. You don't want people to look at you. You're worried about being cool. You're worried about fitting in. It constantly challenged me to learn about expression and communication and and how to really come out in myself. I started ballroom dancing late. When I first started dancing, my mom had me in ballet, jazz, tap, 
a little bit of point in there. I was performing in school, performing with my dance group. Later on, around the time when salsa had this resurgence, J-Lo came on the scene. There was salsa dancing. Also, swing had had a resurgence in L.A., and I was in and out of LA at that time. And I was like, I want to learn how to do that. I, 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 you know, I feel that so passionate about partner dance. And I found a teacher that was willing to teach me salsa and swing. And I just was like, I just want to do this because it looks fun. And I began learning all the dances and got through them pretty quickly, went to rumbo, went to foxtrot. So she was a competitive ballroom dancer. That was her profession. She invited me to a competition and there was a moment where all of the dancers came out onto the dance floor. And you know how you just have those moments sometimes where you're just like, I don't really know what this is, but this is for me. There's something here for me to learn. There's a lesson here. There's going to be a challenge here. When I was watching the dancers, all of that expression, the range of emotions from sensuality and passion to strength, to vulnerability, to love, each of the dances had its own personality. And as a human or a woman, there were so many facets of myself that I hadn't yet explored. So I just was like, I just want to do that. Whatever that is, I want to do it. So I started taking classes, started taking lessons, found out about the world of competitive dance in my early 20s, started competing. I started in pro-am, worked my way up into nationals and semifinals. I had a real blast at that point in my life. That is so awesome. You brought dancing into schools and you have taught wedding couples. Tell us what grade you were teaching and the difference between that compared to wedding couples? Well, children definitely have way less baggage than adults. We know (laughs) that depending on what age you start teaching them, they haven't yet maybe moved into that awkward stage where they're working through confidence. So they have less baggage about moving their body. You may know this documentary, Mad Hot Ballroom. So I remember that movie came out. I remember this movie, Take the Lead, came out with Antonio Banderas, who was going into these schools teaching dance. It turns out that that was a real program. And the founder, Pierre Dulaine, became this great mentor in my life, a big influence on the way that I taught and how I carried myself and designed this program that would go into schools, teach fifth graders and eighth graders. And at this point, they may teach all grades about social skills and life skills through partner dance. They learn how to communicate. And another reason why I love partner dance, how do you work with another person with these verbal cues and also with respect? So you learn about respect for yourself and how to be respectful for others. Through that process, through dancing classrooms, you change partners, everybody dances with everybody, you break down so many barriers. And you probably know in school, you remember, there's just all those clicks of there's that group and that person. And what the ballroom dance was able to create is just break all that down and everybody dance with everybody and put us all on this even playing field. I was teaching at that point in Newark and Jersey City and was part of a team that ended up bringing it to the U.S. Virgin Islands. It's still there, which is really exciting. I fell into teaching after my ballroom days where I got to a point where competition was losing the essence of why I loved dance for just the joy and all the things that it came rather than being judged per se, bringing it back to to dancing classrooms and the children reinstated my motivation and inspiration around dance. Then one of my dear friends ended up getting married. This is many, 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 many years ago. She wanted me to choreograph her wedding dance. I'd never done that before, but I was like, great, cool. Let's do it. And it ended up being a hilarious dance that was so much about their personality. And the couples that were at that wedding wanted me to teach them. And it just Snowball, there was this one family in New Jersey. I did the wedding dance for all of their four kids, all of their friends. It's something I still do today. I love it. What excites me about it is you learn about the couple and through that first dance, you telling their story, what their relationship feels like and getting everybody to witness it, but also feel connected to their love for each other. I love that. I was thinking about you going in the classroom with these kids that may have felt a little bit awkward. The idea of movement and music made their moods go up and then they're interacting with different friends. What a great way to open up a community. That's a really cool idea. And also I have to comment on your wedding dance with Adam. (laughs) He did such a great job. I mean, he he kept up with you. It was so fun to watch. (laughs) He worked really hard. 
hard. He wanted the same experience that I give to all of the other couples. He wanted to go into the studio. He wanted to practice. He wanted to record and watch. And He's I so would catch cute. him practicing on his own in the living room. It was great. That's so great. We were in dance production in high school together, but it was a little bit different. JC, you've worked in front of and behind the camera and you've co-hosted TV shows like an Amazon Prime TV show called Mind Body Go. And you produced and starred in a show for the Travel Channel called Dance the World, which highlights how people move their bodies in different ways all over the globe. Tell us about dancing around the world. Where did you go? What did you learn? It's so fun to talk about these chapters because they bring up such great memories for me. I was always fascinated with the different ways people move their body, cultures, different countries. I can't explain where that came from in me. It was just something I was always interested in. So even in my teens, I would listen to Latin music. I would listen to music from all around the world. It's like from a past life is the only way I can describe it. When I got to that place in competitive dance where at that point, the essence was missing for me, I wanted to learn the roots of these dances. Because when you learn what the competitive style is of samba or the competitive style of cha-cha. It's very different than how the dance originated. I wanted to get back to those roots and really understand where these dances came from, what they felt like. And at that point, there were a lot of shows on television where you could travel through the lens of food or travel through the lens of hotels. And I wanted to do that through dance. I set out on this journey at a very interesting time in my life during my Saturn return, which was a very shadow period. And I started in Southeast Asia. I wanted to basically volunteer where I could. I taught English. I taught driving lessons. I taught dance lessons. I taught whatever I could in exchange to stay and then found masters and teachers of these different dances so that I could learn. I started in Vietnam. I made my way all through Thailand and Cambodia and Laos. I met a producer on Anthony Bourdain's travel show who was running one of the orphanages that I was teaching dance at. So I was teaching dance for the kids and some of the adults. She was willing to film an episode for me as a pitch tape. I came back to the States. I found a producer. I went to Africa. I went to Cuba. I went to Brazil. And we aligned with a production company that the Travel Channel was willing to create the special in Brazil. Wherever you go in the world... Dance is just universal language. I'm sure you've heard that before. You don't need to speak the language. You don't have to necessarily understand each other, but there's just something so on a human level, soul to soul that happens when you're moving together. And for me to do these dances in these places, I got to feel what the culture was. I got to really feel it in my body, an unexplainable, magical thing. That's a connection. We usually hear music is a universal language, but it dances as well. Why does movement release tension and why is it good for our mental health? It's so good for us. It is so good for us. I did learn also traveling around that there are so many places in the world where I mean, people just move and they dance. They don't necessarily maybe call it dance, they call it movement, but growing up dance and movement was a real void in my life. I took dance classes, but no one was dancing in my family, just putting on music and dancing. Without that, I was really yearning and craving for something. To see all of these other cultures where it was just part of your day-to-day -day life and a way to express joy or mourn or grieve or connect with your siblings or your cousins, it created a deeper intimacy and connection. How I experience it, is on a day-to-day -day basis, we have all of these thoughts running around every second, every minute, hours of the day. We are absorbing energy and stimulation. We are stagnant, either sitting, driving, standing, and in potentially a focused state of work for the majority of our day. So tension starts to accumulate, stress starts to accumulate, the nature of the world is affecting us. We all have responsibilities and all of that starts to build. And when we are not moving, that can create stagnation. It can create that feeling of emotional heaviness and how we feel dramatically affects our life. So there are so many studies that promote movement in dance. 
We know that when you put the body in motion, we are able to process feelings and thoughts. We know that the brain releases feel-good chemicals. We know that it settles the nervous system and it is a mood booster, 100%. Absolutely. When you are in that moment, whether it's a moving meditation or just even walking, you're more present and you're more in the moment. And that is so good for our mental health to Mm -hmm. not be feeling the anxiety of worrying about the future and the depression of worrying about the past. I love how there's that body mind connection. I'm sure the listeners will be interested to know that you were engaged to Val Kilmer. What was that relationship like? (laughs) We were together for three years Val was definitely a big influence in my life, especially around spirituality and connecting with nature. There's certain relationships you get into that you just know there's a soul to soul connection and healing to be had there. Just our connection with spirituality and nature and so much of the influences that I was able to experience with him and learn with him was one of those relationships that really stands out in your life as big change and big transformation. And sometimes as we know, those soul to soul relationships necessarily don't translate into day to day function. You have a big love, and sometimes the big love ends in the same way as it starts with a lot of intensity. I was working in the restaurant nightclub industry at that point. My brother had opened a nightclub restaurant in New York City and then ultimately went to open one in LA. I was working with him, learning the business, and we ended up meeting. I had a preconceived idea about actors and just kind of being like, I don't want to date an actor. (laughs) And through a series of getting to know him and him knowing my family, I think ultimately I was like, all right, let's take this risk and see where it goes, adventure goes. I'm sure those were some fun years. So JC, you were also a Lululemon spokesperson and a fit model. And that sounds very glamorous. Tell us about that. Maybe something that people know or don't know about when you hear the word fit modeling, I think they think of someone who is physically fit and is modeling in fitness, but a fit model is like a human mannequin. The clothes that the company is creating is being created off of you, off of your body, off of your measurements. You go through a series of fittings, you help develop, you get feedback. I had this great opportunity to work with Lululemon as their fit model for a new product that was coming out. And I was able to go with them to Sri Lanka and to England and worked in New York City with them. It's one of those jobs where you're able to travel, meet incredible people. The team at Lululemon are so inspiring, so talented, but in terms of glamorous, what what you're actually doing, you're standing for many, 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 many hours at a time. (laughs) Lots of people around you touching you. I remember you wearing something new they had just made and you would run on a treadmill for however many hours. Testing the product. Yeah. To see how it performs with this incredible technology where they could measure how the body would perform with different material. JC, you grew up with a lot of brothers Mm -hmm. and your mom was thrilled to have a daughter, but Mm -hmm. you wanted to be a boy at one point in your life. Is that correct? Yeah. I grew up with all of these boys and you just end up doing whatever they're doing and you want to just do whatever they're doing. You want to be a part of it. Yeah. Yes. And I think at that point, there was not a lot of forward movement around gender roles and identity. It was very much like girls do this and boys do this. And if you identify as a girl, this is what you do. And if you identify as a boy, this is what you do. So to see that they could do these things, but I couldn't felt so isolating to me. It just never made sense of, well, why could they do that? But I can't do that. They can play football, but I can't play football. They're allowed to stay outside playing, but I'm supposed to set the table. It didn't make sense to me. The irony of it all is they're all amazing cooks and are so neat and tidy and have the opposite <laughs> effect on me. I think I subliminally just like rejected anything that you're like, would... I will never <laughs> unload the dishwasher. <laughs> I will never live. Absolutely. It goes against every belief in me. So I was always just questioning, well, why not? Why can't I do this? How come they can do this? How come they can stay at late? Or even just what was acceptable and girls should behave like this. They should be demure. It's okay for boys to be loud and cause a lot of attention and stay out late and all of these things, but not girls. 
that whole double standard of living with a Gen Zer, Amber, who is always educating me. She would say, you can't use the word tomboy anymore because gender is fluid. This younger generation really does understand that you don't have to be put in a box, which I no. think is fantastic. The flip side of that is that you lead these goddess retreats. Now I realize since the pandemic, you haven't been able to, but you have led these incredible retreats in Costa Rica and Brazil. And I know that the site Well and Good named it one of the best retreats. Tell us about goddess circles and celebrating divine femininity. What is that? What do you do? It sounds fantastic. I want to come. Growing up with all of these male influences, I didn't have a lot of girlfriends. I've had a few individual friends, but not a big group of girls. My mom necessarily didn't have a lot of women in her life, maybe a couple of friends, but not a whole community of them. I didn't really understand how amazing women were. We had no idea. I had some negative experiences like we all do growing up. School is hard. Children are hard. Teens are mean. My experience with women were more competitive and a little bit of bullying and a lot of that social pressure. Women that, not supporting each other. Yeah, that it made me want to retract and not pursue that relationship with women. Cause I was like, I guess that just is not going to be for me. So I ended up meeting this incredible teacher, Alison Sinatra, that we became friends with in my early twenties. We traveled to India together for a month. She was doing this, this women's work. And it was through her that I learned really just how magical women are and what happens when you do align for good together and do lift each other up and support each other and create community it was life changing. I just wanted to do that. I wanted to facilitate spaces for that. I wanted other women that may have had the experience that I had to feel what I was feeling. I was doing that through dance. I was doing that through these circles where we would gather and we would move and we would share and celebrate and just be with each other, which just doesn't happen a lot. I was doing that and doing some workshops and leading some retreats. Just having a chance to be with other women, period, I think it's just so healing. The whole time you were talking, I was nodding my head because my friendships with other women are my deepest gifts. I cherish them so much. There's nothing like that same wavelength, compassion, understanding that you can get from another woman. We need mm -hmm. each other. I totally. love that you found that. We're going to talk about the class, mm -hmm. which was founded by Taryn Toomey. She created this class that celebrities like Jennifer Aniston and Christy Turlington and Giselle have said is their favorite workout. And you got on board really early on. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the class and how you've been able to transition it so well into this pandemic age where everything's virtual. Taryn was a part of the women's community and the women's work that Alison Sinatra was leading. I was blessed to know Taryn at that time. And we went on retreats to Peru together and sat in circle together, ceremony together. In 2013, I had first heard about the class and through another girlfriend who was part of the women's group and had taken Taryn's class. I took my first class. I didn't know what to expect other than Taryn said, make sure you get there early. You don't want to miss the beginning. This class was in Tribeca. There was maybe about 40 women in the room. It was packed. As soon as the class started, there was this electrifying energy that came through with the music and the movement. Similar with the competitive ballroom dance, I had that moment of I don't really know what this is yet, but I know this is for me. And I know that there's something that's going to happen here. As that class unfolded, it was undeniable. I just was like, I just want to be around this. I want to be here. I want to be in this room. This is going to really revolutionize fitness on a big level. So unfolding, Taryn asked if I would potentially be interested in teaching. I told her she was crazy. There was no way. It was so hard. I was like, there's no chance I'm going to be able to do this. But she has this ability to really see things before you see things. So in 2014, I taught my first class. I then moved into the role of training teachers. I'm the VP of training at the class and I also teach. 
we were very lucky to have had Taryn and the foresight of our COO, Chris Sanborn, create a digital platform before COVID. When the pandemic really broke here in March, we were able to pivot fairly quickly to all of the classes going online, which has been a huge saving for me just in terms of my own mental and emotional health. And for many of our students that needed somewhere to bring all that was going on with the classes, it is a cathartic experience for the body and the mind. We put the body in motion and through repetition and a music driven experience, you're able to process whatever it is that you need, all the things that you're feeling everything going on in your life through the movements. We're using sound, we're using breath to give you an opportunity to release. It's so much more than exercise. It's really like a a spiritual cleanse that's so needed, especially right now. It must be so amazing to be able to teach people all over the world. There's nothing like face-to-face, of course, which we all miss. Your stories show people their kids are with them or mm-hmm. or there are these beautiful locations all over the world or they're in a small little apartment. It's cool to mm-hmm. be in people's lives like that. Mm-hmm. How has that been for you? It was a, definitely an adjustment to go from teaching group classes with people in the room, even though they were streamed, to then not having anybody in the room for obviously safety reasons. And that transition was one, just as a teacher challenging because you're, you don't have people to feed off of anymore and you're in there by yourself. Can't see anyone. You're talking to yourself. I hope this this is landing. (laughs) Right. But once we started to go live with the solo streaming with just the teacher, I don't know how to explain it other than when it is live, you can feel that there are people there. You can't see them. We don't know who's there. We don't know how many people are there. There's a pulse. There is an electricity coming through that is unexplainable. After class, people start messaging you, which is so nice. Pre-COVID, you would chat with people after class and they would share their experience with you. And now that's happening via Facebook or text message or Instagram, which is amazing that all of these people are having this experience, even though you're not able to see them and something is happening for them. Post-COVID, do you see still streaming class live? One thing everyone has learned is some things work for people, but doesn't work for everyone. Not everyone loves working out from home. Some people really miss in studio person to person experience. Some people feel more comfortable in their own home and less inhibited by looking in the mirror or having people around them. The roadblock of having to go from uptown to downtown or from West side to East side is no longer a thing. Having options for everyone would be ideal. In the class, and I think in life, you believe that it needs to get uncomfortable in order for someone to change. I'm curious how you push your students to go through the discomfort and why is it necessary? If we think about change and transformation, something to go from one thing to something else or no longer be the same, there has to be some level of interruption and disruption. There has to be an element either of heat or an abrasion to come and rub up against it so that it can begin to transform into something else or move or shift into something else. If we want to stay the same, then we keep doing everything the same. If we want to shift something, we have to lean into whatever that programming is, whatever that habit is, whatever that repetitive thing that we do is. And then we have to interrupt it with something different to then strengthen something new. As we're moving, the encouragement and the offering, it's always an offering, everything is always optional, is to really move and lean into whatever that limitation that you may feel is, whatever that block is, wherever it is that it it may feel a little sticky for you. And with the heat and the intensity, safely, knowing that you're going to be okay, knowing that you can stop at any time, knowing that you're going to be able to move through this, to witness yourself work through something difficult and then come out on the other side and feel a shift. A lot of it is helping each other stay accountable of life is challenging. It's hard. There is discomfort. There's suffering. There's no escaping it. There's no magic pill. There's no, everything's going away. We're all going to be happy and joyous all the time. So 
if we can embrace it, if we can accept it, if we can know that discomfort can mean we're on the imp- impetus of change, if we know that getting uncomfortable is helping us find dimension in ourselves and challenging ourselves, then it can shift our perception of this is wrong and this is bad to, huh, this could be good for me. This is something I can get curious about rather than just reject. I love that. It's a real metaphor for life. It's not just in our exercise classes. Discomfort pushes us to get to another pinnacle. Sometimes the hardest moments in our life, that's when we have those epiphanies. And then people walk out and they're so inspired and you've inspired them. Speaking of, the class is now doing a podcast and you are the host and you bring the three pillars from the class into this new platform. The pillars are curiosity, which is a desire to learn, vulnerability, which is a state of openness, and authenticity, which is to show up in a genuine way. Tell us about the podcast, about developing that mental and emotional toolbox, and also who some of your guests have been. We started the class podcast last month as we entered more of the digital world and in the pandemic, creating new ways to connect with our students and and the community. And we have these incredible conversations in class, but then class is over and then we're like, okay, well, cool. But what if I want to keep going? So we wanted to take those conversations and bring it into this podcast form where we can continue exploring curiosity and vulnerability and authenticity bringing in incredible people from all different backgrounds and professions and how they go through life and what comes up for them and how they work through challenge so that we can all add to that toolbox of practicing life. Every episode, I'm joined by a class teacher who is my co-host. We have teachers in LA and Vancouver and New York, and one of them joins, and then we bring in our guest, which We had John Batiste as our first guest with Taryn Toomey, our founder. We've had Brooke Baldwin, this incredible singer, Nikki Morissette, and exploring everything from movement to art, to creativity, to food, to wellness. Everybody has an incredible story. And one of the things I love, I'm sure you love too, is just getting to know people, just hearing people's stories. I know. It's such an intimate platform and medium. You and I are connecting even right now. You and Adam just celebrated your first year anniversary a few months ago. Some say the first year of marriage is the most difficult once the honeymoon is over, but you celebrated your first year anniversary during a pandemic and after getting a puppy. (laughs) <laughs> and living in an apartment in New York City. And we all know you, JC, you have wanderlust in your bones. You would continue to be traveling if this was not happening. How mm-hmm. are you guys doing? <laughs> we never got to have our honeymoon. We, we eloped in the Bahamas for a few days and then had our party later that month in Brooklyn where you came. Got our puppy at the beginning of March and then went into lockdown. There were times where I would say to Adam, like, did we get married? Did we even do that? (laughs) Was that even a thing? Did we travel? Did we have however many people we had in a room dancing together? I'd have to look back at the photos and transport myself back to that time and be like, wow, you know, that was really real. We did do that. And what a turn to think that our first year of marriage together was going to unfold in this way in our one bedroom in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, with everybody working at home and the puppy being home. And I'm sure like many people is having to renegotiate every day even. Okay, well, this works for you. It doesn't work for me. You need this. I need this today. Like just a lot of scheduling and being real teammates. I always thought that the first year was the easiest. So I think that we're doing pretty good. The good news is you guys can survive anything and you have been there to support one another. Marriage is not easy. It takes work, but it's great work. Recently, you opened up on social media about your infertility challenges. I am so grateful that you are so open and willing to talk about this because you're not only helping your self, but you're also helping your loved ones feel comfortable supporting you. 
because it, it's a tricky topic. People feel uncomfortable around it. They shouldn't feel uncomfortable around it, but they do. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing because I think we need to talk about mental health conditions mm-hmm. openly. There's no mm-hmm. shame. There should be no stigma. Brene Brown says this all the time by being vulnerable, you're being really brave. And I think you were very brave to come forward and talk about it so openly. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey? Thank you for saying all of that. It was a huge relief to be able to share about it. I was still going through this thing very isolated or having this thing as a secret or not really being, not that I was lying, but not, you have that feeling of like, I'm not totally feeling honest about my life feeling totally integrated in in all aspects and how I'm showing up. So talking about it and, and sharing it and writing that post was just such a big relief to be like, oh, okay, you know, I don't have to have this secret anymore or be going through this alone. And the outpouring of so many people sharing their stories that felt comfortable from that very simple post on Instagram to express that they too were either going through it or knew someone that was going through it or were about to go through it or was thinking about going to IVF. It helped not feel so alone and also validated, yes, we we need to talk about this. It has to be out there so that we're not holding onto this shameful secret because like you said, it's, it's not shameful. Like many women, you learn in sex ed that getting pregnant is very easy. You do everything you can to not. To not get pregnant. To right. not. And yeah. it's kind of just drilled into you. What is not talked about or what I wasn't educated in is just planning for your fertility. You plan financially, you plan in all these other ways, but there wasn't many conversations about the way that we live our life will shift over time. And every generation that goes by changes a little bit and people get married, maybe older now, their career has a different timeline and a trajectory. They are starting families maybe at different times. And even though that may be how the world is now going, biologically and how our systems are designed hasn't changed. It's still the same plumbing. So there wasn't any education of, well, this is the time period. And after this point, it gets really hard and you may want to think about it. Like many women, you end up just thinking, I know I want this, but one day and you want to have a career and you want to have all of the things. And You want to be able to take care of yourself and be self-sufficient and financially stable and all of this. And maybe you don't have a partner at that time. Maybe getting pregnant and having a baby is not the right fit for you at that time. So fast forward, once you start trying, I just thought, oh, well, it's just going to happen. Like they tell you in health class, you're just going to do the thing and then the sperm is going to meet the egg and that's what's going to happen. You're going to conceive. So it didn't happen. And then it didn't happen. And then it didn't happen. And then it didn't happen. And one of the things I love about Adam is he pushes me and I could very easily be like, yeah, we'll think about that later. Yeah. We'll think about that later. Yeah. We have time for this, but you know, being a dad is for him, his ultimate mission in life. It's such a dream for him. He feels so passionate about it. So he was a big driving force of, you know what, maybe we should talk to somebody. After two years, I had some really great women in my life that had gone through IVF and were also nudging me. You should really go talk to my fertility doctor. When we ended up going on that journey and and starting to have those conversations, I'm 43. So when you start to get towards 40, your odds of conception dramatically drop and it gets really hard. We entered into the world of infertility and you hear that word and you have an idea of what you think that looks like. You probably don't think it's going to happen to you. And it's interesting in my world, I think some of the shame that I've had to work through is that expectation of, well, you're healthy, you're in wellness, you look fit, you work in healing. Why is this an issue for you? So that inner work around that for myself of just not having to feel a shame around it has been a process. Again, thank you for sharing so openly. You really are helping others because it doesn't matter whether you have no problems with 
fertility or not women, we feel a lot of shame around our bodies, whatever stage we're in. And we shouldn't. I am happy for you and Adam that you are talking about this openly because there is that that burden of holding on to secrets is so damaging. I love you guys both. And I, I thank you for sharing that. We are going to jump ship and talk about Chili, your pandemic pup, who is the cutest mm-hmm. thing ever. And she has her own Instagram, which I will also have a link in the show notes. Tell us what it's like bringing dog energy into your and Adam's already very busy life. Adam was a dog person, a dog lover, and kept wanting to get a dog. I was very much a cat person. We had a family dog. I did never have my own dog. And at that point I was traveling a lot and doing retreats and doing all these things. And he wanted like to have a little friend around when I wasn't there. So when we got chilly, I also was thinking being on the infertility journey. Okay. This is good to bring in that nurturing energy. It'll be like our little first baby spirit in the house and bring love. What I definitely did not expect was just to get this puppy and then all of us be in the house together all of the time. Such a great learning lesson, I'm sure, for motherhood and just parenting in general is you have your agenda and you know what you need to do that day. You have this meeting, that meeting, this happens at this time, but that agenda does not apply to the other living thing in your house. They're not on your agenda. They have to pee. They have to go outside. They have to go to the bathroom. They don't understand why you're not paying attention to them on the zoom call. They want to chew on your sleeve. They want to chew on the wire. So it's been a great adjustment for me to have all of that challenged and rocked. You are a dreamer and you inspire others to dream and find their power within them to overcome limitations through movement and guided self-exploration. What advice do you have for someone that's feeling stuck? Because right now, many of us are. What advice do you have to continue to be inspired? It is a really hard time. And depending on where you are with the weather, I'm in New York City, it's cold. It's not necessarily like you can just hop in the car and go to the beach or be outside and and let nature do what it does and its healing properties. So shifting anything up, if you can shift it, if you can take your routine and know that I'm going to do something different today, my calendar is how I keep myself accountable. If I don't put it in there, I probably will brush it off. Having it in there to go take a walk around the block to play music, play a few songs and just shake my body and dance around the house, take chili for a walk, connect with a friend. What happens is we want to make these shifts and we want to feel different, but we think about it as this very big thing that needs to happen. And that can feel unaccessible and overwhelming. Like if I need to feel good, I'm going to have to change my whole life. But as a more sustainable way of these tiny little things you can do, I'm going to drink more water today. I'm going to take a screen break today. I'm going to take a bath today. If you could make a little list of all the things that make you feel good and just start sprinkling them in on a day to day, that's been really helping me. It's a really good reminder. Literally put on a song that you like. It doesn't have to be massive. Start small. JC, we know that when you were 20 years old, you were doing ballroom dancing. If you could write your younger 20 year old self, a dear JC love letter, knowing what you've learned up to this point, what would you tell yourself? My love letter to myself sounds like this. Dear JC, it will be hard, but it will be worth it. You will find your way. It will look different than what is around you. And that is okay. Familiar doesn't always mean healthy. If it doesn't feel empowering, take a pause. Take the time you need to heal the wounds around your worth. Learn about healthy boundaries, toxic relationships, and what unconditional love really means. You will fail. You will succeed. You will find love and great disappointment. There is no escaping the suffering. You will survive and it will make you stronger. It's okay if not everyone gets you. Others will. There will be extraordinary women that come into your life and will help you. Follow the sun, stay close to the water, and keep dancing. JC, I can tell you wrote that out before and I really appreciate that. I want Amber to hear that. My almost 20 year old. Thank you. That was beautiful. Do you have any happiness habits? What do you do that brings you joy? Cuddling chili brings me joy. Music is a great joy. We're blessed to have a car. I love to drive and listen to music. 
different genres of music, different styles of music. Anytime being outside, being in nature always brings me great happiness. Connecting with people I love make me happy. When I think of you, I always see you in this like bikini on like some beautiful island somewhere. <laughs> That's my happy place. <laughs> Your happy place is on like a white sand beach. Yeah, I get a beach that. in a bikini. It's been a long I time. I totally get that. <laughs> Over a year. <laughs> I keep saying when we finally do get out of cages or whatever we want to call this time, we are going to just be so grateful and not take anything for granted. When you and Adam finally get to go on that honeymoon, it's going to be tenfold the appreciation. Well, this has been amazing and I'm so grateful. And I love that I get to call you my sister-in-law. Will you give Adam a big hug and kiss for me? I miss him so much. He misses you too. I tell him all the time. I mean, having a bunch of siblings that you just have such a special, unique relationship. I'm always like, but you guys really love each other. You really like each other. And he's like, yeah. I'm like, but did you ever fight? I mean, he's like, yeah, but we were always really good friends. And you think that's so rare and awesome. Say hi to Adam. Give Chili a squeeze for me. Thanks, JC. Thank you. It was so great. Thanks so much. It was so great. Take care. See you soon. Bye, honey. This is Rachel Steinman. For more information or to contact me with any questions, comments, or guest ideas, please check out rightnowrachel.com. That's right with a W. Thank you so much for listening, subscribing, and sharing, dear family. And if you found value in what you've just heard, I would love and so appreciate a great review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Until next time, I wish you love, happiness, and good mental health.